Welcome to the Cabral Concept, where board-certified naturopath and integrative health practitioner Dr. Stephen Cabral shares how he was diagnosed at the age of 17 with a life-altering illness and given no hope for recovery. It was only after studying and traveling all over the world did he discover how to combine ancient Ayurvedic healing practices with state-of-the-art naturopathic and functional medicine to fully rebalance the body and re-energize it with life. It's time to discover how to get well, lose weight, and finally feel alive again. And now, here's your host, Dr. Stephen Cabral. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. A little different setting here today. If you're watching this on video, welcome. I'm here at a conference, so I'm in my hotel room recording this episode of The Cabral Concept, where we are going to be going over the fat-adapted myth and actually explaining why it is a myth. And again, this is a part three of the three-part series where I'm going to pull everything together so that you better understand your metabolism, you better understand intermittent fasting, and how you can get leaner and burn more body fat if this is one of your goals. Also, a lot of people want to become fat adapted. They also want to be able to use that as just kind of a sled, a steady, slow energy burn during the day. So they have good cognitive ability. So it's not always about the body. It's also about the mind as well. We'll explain both parts of that here today. Today's episode 2266. So if you want to check out all the takeaways and any links for the show, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 2266. That is exactly exactly where all of the previous links will be. All right, let's dive right in. So on episode 2253, I went over basically a quick intermittent fasting tip. That was part one. And what I wanted to do, just to give you a little bit of a gist of that, is to understand that you are the most metabolically active when you are awake, meaning you have the greatest energy demands when you are moving your body. Now, I, I, I know that probably makes sense, but either people are not necessarily recognizing that or they are trying to hack the human body in a way that doesn't work at all. And in the short term, yes, you can absolutely lose weight that way. But in the long term, you're creating a far greater stress load on the body. So let me give you an example. If you are very stressed, you're working hard, you're pushing your body early in the morning, but yet you're skipping breakfast. So you don't have a relaxed morning, but you have a stressful morning, a stressful commute, stressful work, getting the kids ready, hard workout, whatever it might be. What you're doing is you are increasing energy demands. Now, we can't pretend that the body is only going to use fat in order to satisfy those demands. Because as I mentioned in episode 2259, that the body burns its fuel source based on what the demands are at that moment. So if it's aerobic-based demands like sleeping, sitting, walking, well, sure, then around 70% to 80% can actually come from body fat. That's why when you're more relaxed. But when you're stressed, heart rate's elevated, the actual percentage of body fat that you burn goes down. So what that means is that your body is no longer able to tap into that adipose tissue, that stored fat, as quickly to meet energy demands. So it's going to use glucose. It may use oxygen. If you're working really hard, it may use the creatine phosphate system that we've spoken about before on episode 2259. And I do invite you to tune into all those previous shows. But again, all links will be at stephencabral.com forward slash 2266 to make it very easy. So the fat adapted myth comes down to this. The real goal is to burn more body fat in general for some people. Again, so that's why I'm, I'm stating this. Because if you're already lean, you already know that you are fat adapted. I want to repeat that because I think that some people are trying to convince you of something that isn't necessarily true. Everyone here as humans is fat adapted, Okay. Those people that are not a fat adapted would not be here right now. And I want to I want to state that very clearly because your body uses an energy system in the aerobic system that we're in the majority of the day to tap into body fat. So then the rebuttal to me on that would be, well, why am I adding body fat if I'm fat adapted? And it's a great question. And it is a good rebuttal. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're not fat adapted. What it means is that you're storing just as much body fat or you have dysregulated 
insulin and blood sugar levels, plus most likely lower thyroid and higher cortisol and maybe even estrogen dominance. And those, I all explain, I explained all of those on 2252. So when people are telling people, right, experts are telling people, you need to become more fat adapted, I don't know that anybody needs to become more fat adapted. What they need to be able to do is tap into body fat at the appropriate times and then tap into glucose at the appropriate times. But even when you're burning the greatest amount of body fat and you're truly fat adapted when you're sleeping, where it's about 80% coming from uh, fatty acids or fat, you're still tapping into about 20% glucose, right? About 20% other. So when you look at that, well, when you're walking, it's down about 70% and then about 30% glucose. So you're never 100% fat adapted. So when a lot of people are out there trying to somehow uh, override human physiology and say, no, I'm, I'm, I want to become fat adapted. Uh, listen, I get it. I totally understand. But these buzzwords get thrown around without us actually looking into, is this actually true? Like, does this make sense? And so my goal for you would be to, yeah, we want that slow burn of energy all day long, no doubt about it. But when you're doing a hard workout, sprinting, uh, let's say weightlifting based sessions or resistance sessions where the sets last for maximal effort, less than 90, 90, uh, uh, 90 seconds or so. Yeah. You're not going to be tapping in the greatest amount of body fat, but that's okay because the goal isn't to necessarily be tapping in the greatest amount of body fat during a good high intensity interval training, sprint based training, or whenever energy demands go higher. And that's okay because the body then says, okay, we're not able to use ketones at this point. We're not able to use fat at this point. And based on our brilliant human physiology, we can tap into different energy systems of the body. And that's great. But again, it's only going to last for a certain period of time. And those activities are typically going to boost our metabolism, our growth hormone, and our positive hormones in the long run when not overdone. So I believe the real goal that people are saying with fat adapted is to get you to follow whatever their guide may be, or those people that are truly understanding of becoming fat adapted are just trying to get you to better utilize body fat as a fuel source. Now, I agree with that. And that is why I do recommend an overnight fast of 12 to 16 hours. And that's going to work for about 99% of the population. 1% might be suffering from hypoglycemia, Addison's disease, chronic fatigue, et cetera, where they actually, their, their body, again, it's, it's imbalanced, right? I was there myself. I had Addison's disease and, and plenty of other health issues as well. That's for sure. And so for me, going 12 hours wasn't a possibility, but that's only because my body wasn't balanced. Once I got balanced, then I was able to do that. And that's what I do to this day. Now, most people are not going to harm their thyroid, their cortisol levels, their estrogen levels, meaning creating estrogen dominance, um, or, or insulin levels, glucose levels in general, by starting their fast a little earlier at night. Where they do harm it is extending it in the morning and try to push it to lunch. Not for everyone, not for the young. If you're in your 20s, you probably get away with it, right? But it's those people that have a larger amount of stress in their body and many more deficiencies, right? So it just depends on the level of stress you're pushing yourself in the morning and also partly based on your constitution, which I'll speak about in just a moment. So the goal then, if we know that it's not really harmful to human physiology to stop eating earlier at night, basically when it starts to get dark, then that is a good signal for us to say, well, if that's how the body would work naturally, why don't we try to work with the natural rhythms of the body versus fight it as we wake up. So it's just harder for Americans and people in general to skip dinner. And I'm not asking you to skip dinner. I'm just saying, can you bump it a little bit earlier? That's all. Because if you can finish dinner by 6 p.m., and I know, I, again, I'm just saying like that wasn't for me when I was in my 20s, so I totally understand. But at some point, you're no longer in your 20s, right? And so then whether we can make decisions based on not being in our 20s. Um, but you know, in all seriousness, if you can stop eating at six, most nights of the week, maybe on the weekend, sure, maybe it's later, but do the best you can. So if you stop eating at six and you don't start eating until eight, you get a really solid 14 hours. That has been the time frame that has worked the best in our practice to balance that intermittent fast of 14 hours, 
But really, I mean, how it's not that challenging because you might wake up at six or seven. So you're really only going an hour or two and you can still drink some lemon water in the morning, your alkalizing vitamin C, your daily fruit and vegetable blend, your whatever you like to drink in the morning. Like, I mean, herbal tea, like that would all be fine. It wouldn't break your fast. And I'll link up a podcast on what foods break your fast and which ones don't. So check that out today again at 2266. So really that 14 hours seems to work great in our practice because then as stress demands start to increase and as cortisol rises, well, cortisol being a glucocorticoid uh, is going to look for glucose no matter what. So it's going to break it down from your liver and it's going to bring glucose into your bloodstream. So again, you can get it from food or you can have your liver, go, go your body go through a stress-based process to, to break down liver glycogen. And that's, and that's your choice, really. You decide, but again, you don't get to decide how your body works, which is why I'm trying to teach this. Uh, and again, I don't have anything for you. This is, this is how the body works. And this is why I want to make sure that we really understand this so we can, we can use it for life. Now, that's really going to satisfy most people's ability to start um, getting their body to use a slow burn overnight. But then again, as energy demands increase, we want to be cognizant that, well, really the only way to satisfy those demands are with actually some food, right? Like that, that's probably a good idea because if not, your body's going to break itself down in order to get calories. And I know that seems strange, but that's how the body works. It, it's just how the body works. So even if you're saying, well, I'm going to produce ketones, I totally get it, right? I get it. You're breaking down body fats to produce those ketones, but then you're just eating more calories later in the day. So, I mean, if, if that's how you want to play things, you can. I just think that once you get out of your 20s, uh, and especially if you are female, you're going to start to see it greatly affect lowering of progesterone, lowering of thyroid, increasing PM cortisol, as well as increasing uh, relative estrogen to progesterone ratios. And again, we have, we, we've run tens of thousands of hormone labs in our practice, and we just see this play out every single day. So uh, again, I think that there's a happy medium so that we can take in food normally. Again, we can take in three meals a day if we choose to. I think that that's probably the, the easiest way to get all of your macros and micros without uh, overtaxing the digestion necessarily at one meal. I've got a podcast again on why three meals per day. You can check that out. Um, and the last part I'll say is this, is that a lot of people are trying to tell other individuals who have a different constitution than them that they can follow the same plan. So let me just give you an example. Say all the time in my practice, I may have two people and they're both, let's say, five foot eight. One is 180 pounds, one is 140 pounds, okay? And the difference with this individual is their actual physical constitution. It's their body type. So Ayurveda has known this for 6,000 years. Uh, Western medicine figured it out a couple decades ago. One was called doshas, the other is called somatotypes, vata pitta kapha for uh, Ayurveda, and and ectomorph, mesomorph, endomorph for somatotypes. I have lots of Ayurvedic podcasts if you want to check those out if this is of interest to you. The bottom line is this. When you're looking at your resting metabolic rate, like how many calories does this human being burn during the day, you'll find that the ectomorph or vata at the same height burns more calories, yet they weigh less. How does that work? Why does it work that way? That is the physical constitution of the individual. Okay, that is that person burning more calories oftentimes because they're more sympathetic nervous system dominant, which also means, again, if you, were, if you remember right from the very beginning, if you're sympathetic nervous system dominant, you're automatically burning more glucose as fuel. If you're automatically burning more glucose as fuel and you're leaner, how is that possible? Because you should just be burning sugar, not body fat. Well, again, it goes back to you're burning more total calories. And yes, a little higher percentage of glucose, which is why ectomorphs and vatas do better and really well with carbohydrates. One, easier to digest. And that's important when you're in the sympathetic nervous system, right? And they're burning up a whole lot more glucose and they're burning up more total calories, right? So their multiplier times their body weight might be, I don't know, it might be a I don't want to get into that because I have I have the calculators on a different show that will take me down a whole different avenue. But they have a greater multiple on their body weight for how many calories they can eat. Now, we have the endomorph on the other side, right? So the endomorph is more parasympathetic nervous system dominant. They're just a slower metabolic rate. They have a lot of pros, a lot of pros in terms of immune system and skin and hair and nails and longevity and all these great things. But the con is that they have a slower metabolic rate, which can lead them more prone to type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, 
lower thyroid, et cetera. So what do we know? Well, they can eat lower total calories per day. And they typically, they don't want to eliminate all their carbohydrates. That would be bad. But their carbohydrate load is less because they burn less glucose because they're not in the sympathetic nervous system state as much during the day. But it's also why endomorphs get the biggest benefit from doing more physical exercise. Endomorphs need near daily physical exercise to compensate for that slower metabolic rate. And they also need to work on the things that I spoke about in episode 2252 with balancing glucose, balancing cortisol, balancing thyroid, balancing overall hormones, circulation, and just making sure that their sleep is on point. It's more important for them for intermittent fasting and less so for that vata and ectomorph where it can actually be more damaging if they go too long without eating in the morning. So again, when we start to look at humans as, yes, all of the same foundation, no doubt about it, but there is bio-individuality to us. And when we start to treat ourselves as a little bit more not totally unique, but unique in a way that we can customize our nutrition, our intermittent fasting, our exercise, and our overall caloric intake towards ourselves, we begin to see all of this does make sense. It just, it's a little bit nuanced. And it's oftentimes hard to market these nuances for a lot of these companies out there. So uh, I just want you to know that my team and I, were always here to help. Just reach out with any particular questions. I've got lots of shows in intermittent fasting uh, and a lot of shows that I stated on this particular podcast. So if you found this helpful, of course, I would love you to share the show with anyone you believe it could help. And for all those shows that I mentioned today, to go a little bit deeper on that education I would love to share those with you today at stephencabral.com forward slash 2266. Thank you so much. Take care. Have an amazing day. I want to sincerely thank you for your support of this podcast. I couldn't do it without you, and I mean that. I truly do. I also want to make sure you knew that we now have multiple ways for you to find your answers to the most difficult health, wellness, weight loss, and anti-aging questions. You can find podcast-specific topics like thyroid, adrenal, hormones, sleep, digestion, Ayurveda, and many more at stephencabral.com forward slash podcasts that will then link you to your favorite Apple, Spotify, and other podcast players. Plus, all new podcasts and weekly exclusive video content is being added to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash Stephen Cabral. And that's Stephen with a PH. Head on over and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the exclusive content. Lastly, if you've ever found any of my podcasts or books to be helpful, I would really appreciate it if you could leave a review on iTunes or your favorite media player for the podcast. Rating and subscribing to the YouTube and podcast allow me to reach more and more people and help spread my mission of healing throughout the world. Thank you again for being a part of this movement.